Yes, hello everyone and welcome back to another developer live stream for Beyond the Wire. My name's Danny and for anyone who doesn't know, Beyond the Wire is a World War I first person shooter that's coming to Steam Early Access this year and is currently available to wishlist. Um, so we were live uh, just over two weeks ago with an extended look at Freeze from the Somme. Um, and we thought we'd come back online tonight to have another in-depth look at uh, this week's developer update about character models. So we posted an article a few hours ago um, with some screenshots and some character models with uh, some of the updated equipment uh, and clothing. And so we're joined tonight by Creative Director Bruno again. Hey, Bruno. Hi, everyone. And a first time introduction for Juan. How are you doing, pal? I'm going, doing good. Thank you. Welcome, mate. Great to introduce you to the community. So Juan is our art producer and uh, character artist. Uh, so Juan, would you be able to give us a quick introduction on yourself, mate? A little bit of your experience? Yes, for sure. Uh, so many years ago, I um, shared some of my character work in the Squat and Martin channel. People liked it, and I got picked up by a mod team. And that was a very interesting experience because I was able to learn the entire character pipeline from start to finish. And that also developed into important relationships that eventually evolved into what became the Canadian Armed Forces Mod for Squab as a founder early on. At that point, I kind of helped lead the group of artists and developers in the early stages to take it to where it was at the time. And that eventually got picked up by Offworld um, and incorporated into the game, as we know. Uh, and um, at, uh, hired by Offworld to add more um, in, in, into the game. And at that point, I transitioned into Beyond the Wire because there was a need to bring that particular skill into Beyond the Wire, to create more character factions, and help lead a group of artists uh, into the game and to turn it into what it is now. Perfect. Thanks, mate. So, um, with being a character artist, would you be able to talk us through the the path uh, that you took in order to be to become a, a character artist? Yeah, I had an interest in bringing some of that creative vision uh, into through art, and so I learned many of those particular traits early on. A big desire to try to bring that particular skill into uh, that particular art into this. Uh, um, game world and it was something that uh, took a lot out of me because it was something very new but having that passion and drive uh, and consistency helped me achieve the, the state where I'm now where I'm um, um, very excited to be able to do character art for Beyond Wear. Awesome mate and the community have been um, really impressed with what we've shown so far with, with your 3D work and, and the work of the team. Um, so with what you just mentioned there, to, in order to get into the, the trade, so to speak, can you talk to us about the workflow that we take when creating these characters for Beyond the Wire? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, first uh, we get uh, the ideas that we want to create from our game designer. Uh, once I have those ideas, I come uh, to my uh, historical advisor and we create a plan based on how much time I have available to create set assets. Uh, one that's that plan is constructed, and I I, I uh, meet up with Bruno, our creative uh, our, uh, our creative director, in our um, um, or um, the creative director in our um, you know in the rest of the team. Then we decide if it's something that we want to do. Maybe decide uh, something a particular asset has a more strike or visual appeal, and we can replace with something else that we like. Uh, based on that particular feedback and input uh, from our historical advisor. At that point, we then uh, we um, conclude what it is that we're going to be creating, and I can start in with the modeling process. Excellent. And I suppose the starting point for all this, you mentioned the historical advisors. Um, so, Bruno, the references that we use, what, what are our sort of go-to places to make sure that we're making uh, everything as authentic as possible? Yeah, so like Juan just mentioned, we do have a very, uh, uh, an amazing team of historians and um, advisors that are collecting all of these references for us and kind of like putting together this library of uh, references that are uh, being used not only on the characters, but also, you know, weaponry and uh, environments and all of that. Uh, and with the goal of like creating the most authentic 
possible experience for our for our players in most immersive one. Um, it, it really shows on, on the game models, like when you when you look at some some of the details that are there, and I'm sure that we're going to be able to see that a little bit on the uh, on the blog post images that just went out. Uh, there's like there's like very very interesting, very uh, tiny details in there, uh, but. When it comes to where uh, we're uh, uh, getting that that th those images, it's it, there, there's there's lots of sources. Uh, um, a lot of it comes from like let's call it like field, <laughs> actually like going to uh, museums uh, and and taking a look at those collections. This was actually before uh, the pandemic, so it started a while ago, <laughs> uh, but. But actually, going physically to to various museums, collecting uh, pictures and and uh, information about certain uh, uniforms, and then of course, there's also uh, a lot of research being done on the internet, of course, um, and there's also uh, lots of uh, literature that our uh, advisors and historians are using as a reference. Uh, one of them, um, actually, for people who are interested in going a little bit deeper into the, this subject there is this uh, um there's this book it's a it's called actually it's actually a, an encyclopedia it's called a uh, 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 illustrated encyclopedia of uniforms of world war one uh it's by jonathan north and definitely something that i would personally recommend to anyone that is interested in uh going more in depth into the into this this uh you know what was actually used? What what kind of uh, uniforms uh, this these armies were were actually wearing uh, in the battle? And yeah, definitely would recommend that to anyone who's into that kind of like more historical approach to it. For sure. In fact, after this stream, we'll get that link, Bruno, into the World War One History Channel in our Discord. Absolutely. We'll, we'll get it posted in there if anybody wants to have a look at that. It's really good references. Um, so with we mentioned there referencing as much as we can um in order to gain that authenticity so how do we how do we um combat uh, similarity between the characters when we're talking about different roles Bruin, uh juan sorry um obviously we've got mul multiple roles across the team in in different sections so so what are we doing to ensure that we've got that uh, variety yeah from the very beginning it's taught us to have something that's very flexible something that's very modular, that allows us to have flexibility across characters. This means that uh, I start from the process of creating the base character and laying the various parts on top of the model in such a way that we can change them across the different roles, meaning that we can have a character that has a harness and a, another character that does not have the whole act back, certain backs, maybe the gas mask, depending on the particular character role. And that allows us to have that kind of flexibility and modularity, meaning that the various models and parts are uh, created separately from that approach from the beginning so that we can uh, have that flexibility later on. Awesome. And we're just going through the screenshots that we um, showed in the blog earlier. Um, have we discussed about the modulation, uh, Juan, where we are able to bolt on and bolt off uh, things like pieces of clothing uh, and various equipment? Yes, uh, it's the extent of the modularity is pretty flexible that to, to the point where we can have different shoes, maybe different pants, different shirts, uh, different uh, hat variations. Maybe we want to add a scarf, gloves, and everything fits interchangeably as best as possible. You have some things that you have to take into account, like, for instance, the coat might be a little bit larger, longer, larger but... Uh, some things might not fit perfectly, but yet you still have some flexibility as best as possible to try to fit as much as uh, as much of the equipment together efficiently. Uh, and that's something that we uh, thought up from the very beginning to ensure that we could have some consistency across the characters. Awesome. Uh, thanks, mate. And that uh, you know, leaves a lot of options for us going forward um, to be able to just whip out, whip in and out various pit, uh, bits depending on, on what we need. Um, so with that variety in mind, Bruno, um, with the clothing and equipment, can we expect any di diversity across the actual characters themselves, facial features, hands, things like that? Yeah, it's actually a really interesting system that we came up with for, for Beyond the Wire. 
um, if if you if you play the game and if you look at our uh, soldiers' faces, um, each face is actually unique. There's a very little. It's a very small chance that that you are going to see like two soldiers that look exactly the same. Uh, Ever like they're because they are generated uh, uh, combining different features from uh, different uh, uh, well basically yeah combi combining different facial features uh, we we are always coming up with a new face so every time you spawn in you're a new person so uh, it that's great for for uh, you know like that that added uh, variety that you would see in a in a uh, in a in, in war right so. Uh, each person is their own person and has their own facial features and all of that. So we try to recreate that a little bit with this system. And and the results are really interesting because all of a sudden our characters don't look, they, they no longer look like they are like uh, mass produced, <laughs> but instead they're their own individuals, which is really interesting. Um, and that was actually, I think Juan can comment on this a little bit more, but that was done in a very interesting way where uh, we combined, uh, well, we, we got like 3D scans of uh, various uh, uh, various faces and heads and combined them together uh, uh, in real time. So that was a, that was a really interesting piece of uh, technology that was created for that there. Yeah, Juan, it was actually something and we... We did something similar. Sorry, mate, go on. Yes, we did something similar for the hands where we actually took the 3D scan of the hand, that is the, the pores, the details, the skin, uh, and then transfer that into our base model in our animation system. So we can take the performance, so we can take the quality of the hands while also retaining the performance uh, in an animation system. And uh, it, it's the same thing for the heads, except that we actually kept, kept the facial uh, structure. That way we can morph it in between heads so that we can have a variety of looks a different look, a unique look every time. Yeah, and all of those are really, uh, it's really detailed. Like uh, we just saw on the on the video that was playing here on the stream, but those are our in-game models. That's not a uh, that's not like a, a render model or like a high poly model or anything like that. That's literally what players are going to be seeing in game, and and that's the level of detail that we're going for here. So Bruno, what do we yeah, have the to... flexibility of the Sorry, sorry, Juan. I was just going to ask there with the level of detail we're putting into the models, Bruno. What is the is there any sort of performance impact? Bearing in mind we are fifty v fifty. That's a very interesting point to bring up. Actually, um, I was just thinking about that one specifically. Uh, when you're when you're talking about having you know a hundred players in a battlefield uh, with this level of quality, that's that's no. Uh, you know, it's it's not easy to pull that off technically, um, and the way the ways we're doing this is working with lots of you know uh, in in game development. There's this thing we call uh, LODs, which are it, it stands for level of detail. Basically, what it means is uh, every time you move away from a certain um, 3D model, you kind of like simplify it a little bit and and remove some of those details and remove some of those polygons. So you are not going to be, uh, let's say, like overloading your uh, graphics card, right, with all that information. But because they're now smaller on screen, uh, you uh, you actually don't notice that as much because you know it just became smaller. You're not like, let's call it like you're not zoomed in hmm. into that face anymore. Um, so and and that's pretty much what we we apply to this uh, to these models. And it's pretty like uh, uh, it's an industry standard. But we did have to uh, spend a lot of time on Beyond the Wire to get that to work on this level of quality uh, uh, on uh, on 100 players, right? And that's on top of the entire, you know, like all of the environments, all of the special effects, all of that goes through that same process um, where in the end you have, a, a, you know, like a, 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 you have good performance, even though you have so much going on and so many uh, players running around and uh, uh, engaging in combat. Awesome. Juan, was there something you wanted to add on? Uh, yes, uh, essentially uh, it allows us to have a high quality model. When you see it up close in the camera, you can see all the detail of the model. And as you move away, uh, it switches to a lower resolution model that performs better, that doesn't have as much detail because it's further away in the camera and you don't see it. So having that uh, 
in place allows us to have a lot of detail in the models, sometimes even 100,000 triangles in a particular character model. So you can see all that high resolution and definition up close while still retaining the performance features of uh, necessary to have a, a good uh, performing game. Perfect. So um, I suppose the only thing left to say really for, for, for us is um, we will be doing some questions from the chat as well. So, so we'll start getting them in there. Um, what was going to be coming next for the character models? Because we obviously explained that the the first reveal we did were very placeholder and and foundational. Um, what can we expect now going forward, uh, releasing into early access and beyond? The British faction. Uh, we're in the process of collecting references and defining which particular assets we're going to be creating for the particular models. Uh, and uh, that's a process that allows us to kind of be able to emphasize the things that we want to bring in. Uh, and make the characters in the different factions more distinct with one another, meaning that we have the flexibility to bring something that's uh, unique to that particular faction, while at the same time uh, having it to be very historical accurate. And I think Bruno might be able to speak a bit more about that as well. Yeah, so um, as we announced, uh, when, when, when we actually announced the game for the first time, we uh, briefly mentioned this, and there was a little Easter egg on the trailer, actually, um, uh, uh, but yeah, the, the British faction is being worked on. We, uh, you know, already collected, uh, like Juan said, a lot of reference, and it's going to be uh, um, a really comprehensive uh, representation of the uh, uh, the British Army during uh, World War One. I. I feel like that's going to be really interesting. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know what else to say about this right now, but it's it's because there's a lot to say, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it, yeah, it's it's turning out really really interesting. Uh, work has already started on that front, um, and it's it's beautiful. I can't wait to share it with you guys when the time comes. I suppose one thing we can say, and something that is further along than the Brits are the American Expedi Expeditionary Force, which um, we should be having some information on for you all next week. So um, the Americans are coming, so um, we should be able to start seeing some of those models very soon. Um, Thanks very much, lads. That was great, very informative. Um, we're going to go straight over to the uh, chat questions. Uh, and one I've noticed straight away that we can answer. Um, were there any things that we found hard to find historical references for? And was there, was there anything that we wanted to add but we found out wasn't actually that relevant for the time? Uh, there's absolutely a lot of stuff because this war happened, you know, like a hundred years ago. There's a lot of stuff that got kind of lost. Uh, there's very little reference of some some items, some equipment. There is uh, almost no uh, pictures of some of those things because you know they don't exist anymore. They were lost in you know the the wheels of time somewhere. Um, there's this specific. Uh, um, I remember like the guys trying to find some references for a, a smoke grenade. I, I believe it was a French smoke grenade. Um, can't remember its name right now, but we ended up finding a very like obscure website that had pictures of it, of the actual item. Um, but it, it was, it was like a, like a little bit of a treasure hunt to actually uh, gather those pictures. And uh, well, it's in the game now. So let's hope uh, our, our, uh, collection of those those references will be also useful historically for someone right <laughs> yeah for sure yeah yeah it's definitely a struggle i mean sometimes you have good references but it's understand that it's, it's understanding that sometimes you cannot find references uh, that are from all angles so that you can see precisely all the details that you need in order to be able to sculpt the model but uh you make do with what you have and try to make the best of it uh and generally uh it's generally comes out okay because uh, it requires a lot of thinking sometimes more than you should to try to get that particular look that you want but it's uh, something that we can pull it off something that we can take the time and and get that excellent thank you um next one will we see semi-automatic rifles smgs and different variations of shotguns uh I think we should wait until we talk about the Americans before we go into the shotgun subject. Um, but other than that, we're uh, 
most uh, were like focusing on or, or trying to show uh, the weapons that were used uh, in in larger scale. So we're not going to be seeing like you know prototype weapons and stuff like that. It's more like uh, uh, bolt action rifles, uh, some pistols, things that were actually used in large scale uh, during World War One. Excellent. Uh, and then a the follow-on from that, which we have answered before, is um, will we be getting flamethrowers? We're trying. We're doing some testing, so we'll see how that goes, but uh, we can't confirm anything on that front. Um, will uniforms change for the factions based on the year or the map location? Um, they don't currently change. Uh, we do have some... some uh, uh, investigation going on on the on that subject and you know like how much that would add to the to the to the player's experience uh right now i can't uh i can't really say uh if we're doing it because we're still uh still investigating and figuring out what's the best uh you know best use of our resources when it comes to that uh so let's wait and see given the modularity of the characters if, if it is something that we want to add in the future it it's certainly something we can certainly do without having to redo anything essentially because uh, the platform set in place to be able to have something like this yeah absolutely there are some technical issues when it co or challenges when it comes to that though so that's kind of like what we're uh that's that's why it's still like a, a little bit of a, a a question mark when it comes to specific um specific uniforms and specific years and specific locations um I personally would love to do that, but I feel like it, it it's not just you know it's not just like oh do you want to do something right it's uh, there's a lot more than 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 just that unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, it certainly requires a lot of consideration. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, next one, which we have answered, but uh, for the benefit of the chat, um, will we see tanks and horses in the future? Um. There are dead horses on the field. I feel like uh, that's that's uh, the thing that always people always ask about. Yeah, we do have dead horses, but we don't have. Uh, let's call it. Uh, you you can't, you know, jump on a horse and run around. I, I feel like this wouldn't uh, this wouldn't work very well on Beyond the Wire, uh, considering the amount of, you know, machine gun fire, artillery fire, all that that stuff that's going around. Uh, that horse wouldn't leave for very long, uh, so we're not we're not representing that that side of the war. Uh, but we are we are gonna have uh, uh, in, in a more immersive way where you know like those horses were there. They they are represented in the game, but they are unfortunately already uh, no longer between the players. Right, and it ties into that whole discussion. Um, you know, vehicles, size of the map atmosphere we want experience we want and then just the simple fact of how hard horses are to develop and do oh, yeah. well anyway so infantry first and a polished infantry, infantry experience and then we'll see exactly um are we considering voice lines for soldiers yes we mentioned that in the stream last time we do have voice actors um and voice lines which will be in the game Uh, I think we might have answered this before, but there's a couple of questions. Will there be any character customization? So we're actually looking into that right now. I don't think uh, character customization is going to be there for uh, for early access uh, or for our first release, but it, it's definitely something that we are investigating quite. Uh, we're like really concentrating on on figuring out how how that could be done. And how that would affect the game in various senses, because you, if you think about it, you, it, it it can become really um, complicated when you have, you know, uh, uh, let's let's if if it's just like a, a regular, you know, you can unlock items. Let's just think about the, it this way. Let's say you unlock an item, and then all of a sudden you're trying to equip it to a soldier, but that item didn't exist at the time where, you know, where, where you're playing. Um, so you can get really complicated. So we're looking at some options and uh, figuring out exactly what we're going to do about customization. It's it's something that we really want to do. I feel like it would add a lot to the game. 
I personally like uh, having customizations on a game like like this, and I feel like Beyond the Wire would benefit a lot from it. Um, and yeah, uh, as soon as we were able to like figure out those technical uh, challenges, um, I I do think that we're eventually going to have it in the game. Um, but let's wait a little bit more and see. It's it's still like pretty early on in the process, um, so I don't want to make any promises here, but. Uh, uh, it's something that we're uh, uh, investigating and, and, yeah, trying to find a solution to. Yes, someone saying, I just want to put a moustache on my French soldier, please. So the desire is there. And the desire, oh, yeah. is, the desire is there for us also. I know um, the team, if we can, we will. So um, we'll see what happens. Um, any kind of proximity or local chat? We have local chat. However, it does not broadcast to the enemy team. It's only to the friendlies within a, a certain radius. Um, will the level of a player influence the way their character appears? For, exam for example, having a dirtier or more worn uniform or even go into things like decoration? Yeah, that goes a little bit into the, uh, the customization features that we're investigating. I feel like... Um, ideally, we would be able to show, like, you know... Uh, uh, differentiate a, a veteran player from uh, a, a new player uh, by just you know like just their uniform maybe their uniform is a little bit uh, dirtier or like more uh, worn out uh, so those are those are things we're considering for sure when it comes to the uniforms themselves and the art that was signed for that in mind so if we ever decide to create a system that has uh, customization opportunities uh, that's going to be a possibility although there's as bruno suggested there's a very big implications when it comes to uh, creating this type of system because there's so many things that revolve around having something that's well executed uh, and appealing to the players as well uh, so um, with that in mind we're going to be able to make a decision at some point later on Excellent. And so we'll finish with this one. Uh, for release, is there any sort of PR thing planned? Um, content creators and streamers, etc. Yes, there will be a significant effort going towards PR and marketing in the build-up to release. So um, don't worry about that. Everyone will be seeing Beyond the Wire. Um, right, so that's it. I think we'll call it a night there and let you lads get back to work. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having us. Always a pleasure to be here. And thanks to the community and all the all the people watching the stream right now. Um, yeah. I'll see you all next time. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Bye. everybody, for watching. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.